Hello everyone. I, Dr. Archana Tiwari, People and Culture Manager at V360.ai, would like to welcome all the listeners to our LinkedIn talk show series, Productivity League, hosted by V360.ai. Productivity is the art of turning intentions into actions and actions into achievements. We at V360.ai believe that the productivity is not just a metric, it's a way of life. So productivity is an ever-growing habit where we learn each day and implement the learnings to be at least 0.1% better every new day. In our talk show series, Productivity League, our, our mission is clear to build a dynamic and constructive learning community around this vital topic, productivity. The objective is that we all will grow together with the collective knowledge and experience of our entire community. So we are diving deep into the topic that's not just a workplace initiative, it's a fundamental soul of modern organizations, upskilling and reskilling workforce. In this episode, we are privileged to have two distinguished guest speakers. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Amit Kataria, the CHRO at Menfi Technologies and Mr. Manoj Chuk, Chairman at Manoj Chuk Advisory LLP. Together, they bring a wealth of experience and insights to this amazing conversation. Welcome. So let me introduce our first speaker. Mr. Amit is a global HR leader and recognized in Asia's 100 HR power leaders. He was also listed amongst the top 50 CHRO of the year 2023. Our other guest is Mr. Manoj, is an information and communication technology industry visionary. Till recently, he was the president group public affairs and member of group executive board of Mahindra and Mahindra Limited. Prior to that, he has been the committee or boards of some esteemed organization like SARC, Cisco, Wipro, SCL, to name a few. I would like both of you to give two minutes of introduction about your exciting journey. And then um, I'll hand over the mic to today's moderator, Mr. Kunal. So I would like uh, Mr. Amit to you know start with. Thank you, Dr. Arshna, for such a wonderful uh, session today and Usangit, and for the kind words. This is Amit Kataria signing in. Uh, I don't know I have much to speak two minutes on me, but I will give you a little backdrop uh, how I started my journey and how I ended up in HR. So my friends, uh, very good morning to all of you and thanks for joining this uh, exciting talk show. And this topic is very, very close to me about the strategies of upskilling and reskilling in the challenging times. So I started my journey in 2003 you know, uh, with the aim to become a scientist. Uh, I did my physics honors uh, back there. There was a time you know, where you know, we were putting India as a scale of uh, you know, power, which has a substantial uh, outlook for space technology. So I thought, why not to do that? And I had very close affinity to science. But later when graduated, I realized uh, computer is the one uh, and this uh, employability and all that towards science was not that lucrative. So I did my master's in computer application. And there, when I got placed uh, in one of the major IT companies, uh, I saw how the HR is a power center at the core of it. I thought to do that. So that doesn't tell you that I was not clear, but that tells you that I took lots of time in realizing where my passion lies. So here I ended up uh, joining and doing my master's in uh, uh, HR and then started my journey with one of the IT company, Motorola, in their branch. Then I joined another league, uh, which was a startup of that time, uh, spent a good 17 years there, became their CHRO, having a global force. And today I'm associated with one of the GSIs uh, based out of Hyderabad called Menti. And that's how my journey upfolds and rolls till now. Over to you, Dr. Rajna. Great, great, great. It's very inspiring. So actually, I also feel that if, if you are passionate about something, if your interests lie somewhere, then obviously it should be, you know, I mean, you should um, pursue your career or the profession in that particular segment only. So wonderful, wonderful. Um, I would request uh, Mano, sir, if you can uh, give us, uh, you know, brief about your journey. Uh, thank you very much, Archana. And first of all, a uh, very, very uh, a big thank you to all the listeners who are listening in. Amit, uh, great to get to know you virtually a bit. Uh, very happy to see many old friends uh, on this call 
Uh, so guys, uh, thank you very much for joining and thank you very much for cheering me on just as you've done over the last more than four decades. Uh, in terms of my journey, it's, uh, it's a very simple journey. I divide my journey into three phases of 14 years each. And I know that the number 14 uh, is very evocative, particularly uh, since we are, uh, you know, in, um, uh, in a near Diwali. So 14 has been an important number in my career as well. Uh, I graduated from IIT Kharagpur and uh, joined the IT industry at that time. Uh, there was no IT industry, so you just kind of hope that this industry would uh, survive, if you will. Um, so I chose not to go into traditional engineering uh, careers uh, and spent the first 14 years uh, with uh, the startups of my time. I graduated in 1982. I know I sound like a fossil. Um, so 14 years with, uh, with HCL and Wipro. I joined Wipro when they were uh, just about getting into the IT industry. Um, so it's been a great journey with them. Next 14 years, I worked with product technology firms. I had the honor and opportunity of leading uh, many of the marquee firms of our times. And of course, they continue to do incredibly well. Uh, one in uh, satellite networks, a firm called Scientific Atlanta. I set up their operations in India. I led Cisco's operations here uh, when Cisco had the opportunity to make significant investments uh, under my watch. Uh, and then I worked for a long time at EMC now acquired by Dell, uh, called Dell EMC. Um, so that was the second phase of 14 years with product technology firms. And uh, the last uh, several years, um, I had the honor and opportunity of working in the global IT services space. Um, but as they say, a little hutke, uh, I had the opportunity of integrating Satyam's uh, business, uh, which had got uh, uh, you know, folded into an entity called Mahindra Satyam. Many of you must have heard of the Satyam saga, particularly all guys in HR, I'm sure have done a, at least one case study uh, in their process of education right. on Sat what happened there. Uh, so I had the opportunity of integrating that business into Tech Mahindra, and then we grew that business very, very substantially. So from an HR perspective, from a people perspective, I would say skilling, reskilling, upskilling has been an integral part of my journey uh, over the last over 40 years. Uh, because without that, uh, you know, one couldn't have survived so long. As I say, this is a marathon uh, and you have to live for a long, long time and, um, and live successfully. So thank you both of you for being um, here today with us. We are really privileged and honored to have, uh, you know, such a panel with us today. Now I would uh, hand over the mic to Mr. Kunal, the CMO at v360.ai. Mr. Kunal, the mic is thanks. on yours. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Arjuna. Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So, yeah. Hi, Mr. Amit and Mr. Manoj. Uh, we are really privileged to have both of you here. And I'm sure that our listeners will be able to grab some amazing experiences in this talk show. And uh, I mean, let me tell you this. Uh, for us also, the, I think that this is going to be one of the most exciting talk shows that we ever had. Because you both seem to be amazing, amazing people with amazing uh, journeys. And the exp I'm like, while you were introducing yourself, I can feel that energy and that freshness still there in both of you. So thanks a lot for coming here and for being here with us today. Yeah, pleasure is all of us. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, so what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll quickly explain you the structure of today's event. So what I would uh, want is like, I would like that both of you uh, to provide your own thoughts and insights on today's topic as a kind of opening statement, wherein like uh, we will have at least around five to seven minutes each for both of you here. And then what we can do is we can get into some specific questions that we have received from our listeners. And uh, while uh, while getting into those questions, I'm mean, like, I, I would like both of you to answer at least like two to four minutes on each of those. So I would like to understand from both of you on how the same challenges or the same questions or the same problems have solutions addressed differently to the organizations of different sizes and, and cultures. Since both of you come, come from varied backgrounds, uh, varied profiles, varied kind of journeys. So how you have experienced into those specific challenges. So, and we'll have, as I told you, we'll have at least like two to four minutes for every uh, question to answer for each of you. So that we have enough time also. So getting into the real action, I invite Mr. Amil uh, to express your thoughts. So uh, I just want you to like, uh, since you have such an amazing journey, what I would want or like what the listeners would also want to understand is like, can you share your own uh, like journey where you like upskilling or reskilling played a pivotal role in your career development and personal journey? I hope you already addressed a little bit of that. 
while in your introduction we just like to get some more intricacies into that and what were the lessons that you learn along the way and how can you can your journey inspire our audience in this pursuit of professional growth and adaptability sure and all and thanks for giving this story um uh, yeah very interesting thought and you see the topic itself is very very interesting and i will take minute or so you know to reflect upon that why why this is so critical at this point of time these are today we see we are at a very critical juncture with the rate of change of change is super rapid and i give you one example let's say if you take a linear scale of time from from the angle that what is the age of earth it's around 4 billion years right and on those 4 year 4 billion years the human existence of human is in just few thousand years if you say so and if we if we take it a little further the change we are now i take it from the time when humans discovered fire humans discovered uh, we there if you realize every invention or discovery took us or took human race around thousands and thousands of years right then that discovery and invention became the matter of centuries like you no know, after the fire the age of industrialization came it took us few centuries to get there after the centuries you know the rate of change became just decades like you no know, the invention of internet things started changing within decades and from where if you take the down journey decades become years years became months months became day and the classic example is if with the advent of ai the tool we all know that like gpt i remember just 3 months back i was using the version 3 right now it's 4.5 point something within just span of days so that's what i want to tell you that the change we are experiencing the velocity with it is happening it's something nobody could have imagined and it's happening at the pace where now if we do not keep the pace ourselves of you no know, having us to upgrade to the same level we would be left behind and I, i now i will come back to this main topic where we say the upskilling and reskilling why and what i feel so from from the point of hr and i've seen like from last two decades you know uh, i have spoken of uh, work with such a wonderful minds who are passionate who were best of their fields but people who did not excel people who did not go to the curve where it was it was anticipated was that their lack of you know filling the gap they had right so many of them lived in a shell where they 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 kind of felt that everything is not coming to them they are they are spared from the time and that's what i think is a major problem we encountered that time or i still feel that people are not taking the change very seriously and then they are not going from the direction that you know with the advent of new tech they have to upgrade themselves they have to reskill themselves so that they remain at par with the need of skill with the need of time and one last uh, you know 30 seconds i would spend before i get into mr manoj the world is now moving from credentials to competencies and that that kind of changed the outlook very much before that no if you come to hr you no know, there were few things which are very very uh, obvious was to go through what you have done in your education papers this and that but now i i think hr of the world are not even spending the time going with that pedigree you have it's about what you carry in your skills and that's something i think uh, to remain competent you have to work more on the competencies and skill side and we will be discussing that in our longer discussions when more question come for the upskilling and reskilling over to you mr manoj and amit yeah thank you very much amit uh, and i and i guess uh, uh, you've done a wonderful job i must say in terms of you know laying the foundation for this discussion you know starting from prehistoric times and the history of man uh i guess you know when one is older one always looks back and i think every generation and in technology because that's the industry i've been all my life every 10 years is one generation so i started my career more than 40 years ago so i'm at i'm like four generations older if you will than most people you know of the current generation and i can only tell you that in each generation everyone thought that the rate of change uh in technology was much much faster than they could perhaps um uh, grapple with understand 
and ride the wave. I know today guys will all turn around and so it's AI and you know the changes are far more. I can tell you that the changes have always been very rapid. Uh, when you look at the infrastructure that was available to that generation and the environment uh, and the overall business opportunity, please let's remember that if you look at India 40 years ago, the GDP of India was $200 billion. Today it's $3.7 trillion. We talk of 5, 10, 20. So when the size of the economy is significantly lower, the impact of even relatively modest uh, changes of rate in terms of technology advancement has a huge, huge impact on individuals and organizations. So my message is, irrespective of which generation you are in, the rate of change will always be very significant. People of the current generation believe that the rate of change now is, um, uh, is the fastest ever. It's never been like that. I can tell you when uh, internet showed its head in 2000, and I was blessed and fortunate to play an incredibly important role uh, in seeing where internet is in India today. We all felt that uh, the change was something we had never fathomed and seen before. And prior to the internet, uh, when we looked at computing architectures, we started looking at the advent of the PC and how empowerment moved to the front end to client server architectures, uh, you know, each of those. And then before that, multi-user systems, mainframes. I think every generation, when we looked at the rate of change, we felt it was very significant. But if one has to survive as a professional, it is incredibly important that you need to upskill and reskill yourself. It is not that guys of my generation survived for more than four decades without upskilling and reskilling ourselves because the rate of change was not fast enough. The fact is you will not survive more than 10 years in any generation if you are not upskilling and reskilling yourself. In terms of learning, uh, it's incredibly important that in every generation, you seize the opportunity that is in front. So in today's generation, you have MOOCs platforms. When I started my career, we had tech publications. Uh, but it is very, very important that one remains grounded, looks for content, upskills and reskills oneself. And that is a personal journey. Uh, so I think that unless one upskills and reskills oneself, it is not going to be possible to survive more than 10 years particularly if you're in an industry which is significantly influenced by technology. And the, the ownership uh, and the initiative has got to be that of the individual. Uh, I know many times people turn around and say, but my boss is not helping me and so on and so forth. I know Amit as an HR professional, you'll keep hearing about this. My last comment is that frankly, Organizations need to create the learning opportunities for employees and become enablers. I think in every business that I've had the opportunity of leading uh, in my career, uh, I have never had, a, never had an issue where people did not want to upskill or reskill themselves. I think it all begins with the leader. If the leader is a true state-of-the-art leader, rest of the organization automatically follows through. They don't need to be quoted. They don't need to be convinced. They don't need to be pushed because they realize that, look, if this guy who is my boss, who's maybe 10, 15, 20 years older than me, knows so much about technology, what's happening, uh, how it can impact, how it can influence, then certainly I should be stepping up and doing something about it. So I think the question I ask many times is, is the leader himself or herself the role model? Or are we just trying to push some... Uh, IT applications to force people to get skilled in areas where they may or may not uh, really see uh, their future. I know it's a long discussion, but we've got some time. And again, uh, again, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Manoj. In fact, thanks to both of you for like bringing an amazing perspective. So one thing uh, which I'm um, like, which you both have clearly mentioned and outlined is like, be it any specific time of the humanity, upskilling and reskilling has always been there. If you actually want to match up the the growth of the society or the growth of the industry. And as you rightly said, Mr. Munoj, that it's like, of course, in the current times, you still have to work on upskilling and reskilling, but of course, the speed matters. You actually have to cope up with the speed because the world is moving very fast. And and, and one more, like, one very important thing that you also said, which generally happens or like, uh, like becomes a center point in most of our discussions, that most of the thing starts top to down. So instead of uh, we thinking that like bottom up uh, growth or improvement happening in the company, it's like top down approach that a company or team should actually adopt. 
so that's a very very good uh, uh, perspective so uh, so now uh, the exciting part begins wherein like people have the questions and people are excited to know some of uh, their doubts and and the situations that they face in so uh, I'm, i'm just put, going to put up the first question and this time mr manoj i just want to start with you to answer this question so uh, in your experience uh, what are the most critical skills or competencies that the modern workforce needs to acquire to upskilling and reskilling so this is a beautiful question and aligns with what exactly you were trying to say in in just the previous line that the current workforce has to match up but like what are the most critical skills or competencies that you feel that the current workforce should actually focus upon yeah you know again thank you it's a very profound and introspective question uh, to my mind you know every business today is a technology business and uh, when i speak to uh, to many people across industries they come and turn around and tell me that look you know we are first in the technology business and then we deal with money we are in banking or we are first in the technology business but we also happen to run an e-commerce platform in retail uh, you know we are first in the technology business and then we also happen to be in hospitality and so on and so forth in fact at one point in time i turned around and said looks like i am the only guy who doesn't seem to be any more in the technology because business because everyone's got into my business so that was just tongue in cheek so i think that uh, digital literacy uh, is incredibly important even if you are not a coder and you don't need to be one and you don't need to learn uh, coding uh, necessarily as a skill but having empathy with technology what is it that technology can do for you how can technology help you in terms of improving your own productivity in terms of delivering better outcomes in terms of driving efficiencies of your own processes uh, and then of course in today's day and age uh, with the plethora of data you know being mindful of data privacy and being mindful of others rights i think that is the first area in terms of technology empathy uh, which somebody absolutely needs to acquire as a critical skill the second quick one i'd like to point out is around problem solving uh and i think that in today's day and age i find people spending lesser and lesser time in terms of applying alternative thinking uh doing stuff linearly is easy but thinking out of the box is never because it needs your right brain and your left brain to come together uh, because many of us are either right brained or left brain that means either we are quantitative uh in terms of our approaches to life or uh, we are qualitative in terms of our approaches to life i think we need to bring in both together the creativity aspect and the quantitative aspect of being able to leverage data to help in terms of solving the complex problems that exist today the third important skill and you could call it a soft skill for me it's a hard skill is around listening uh so people talk a lot about communications but i think a more important skill is around listening because once you are able to listen actively uh, the collaboration piece becomes much much better and i would say the second part of communication which i'd like to encourage people to learn and improve upon is their writing skills people tend to be very verbose you know you need to be able to convey a message in a few bullet points uh, and i think it's incredibly hard to convince people to do that and the reason is because they lack clarity of thought so that again uh, is a skill which i think everyone must pick up uh leadership you don't need to be a manager or have a team of people to pick up this skill i think just taking up initiatives on your own raising your hand and saying i'm willing to take up this task which is over and beyond what i am supposed to deliver uh, based on my current role i think will help significantly uh, so i think skills around you know prioritizing what is important understanding what the firm needs raising your hand and then driving those initiatives just even if it's not just leading them but just driving them being a part of it being an active participant in itself is an important skill for many businesses which are global and i'm sure amit will relate to that uh, culture is another important piece how do we adopt to cross cultural situations uh, uh, and that's going to help us uh, significantly going forward in the future uh learning is lifelong and we know this but i'd like to end by saying that uh, if you are in a highly specialized area then your own area of expertise and specialization you need to make sure that you keep yourself updated certified upgraded uh, so that 
you can make sure that you're truly delivering value to the ecosystem that you're a part of. I know it's been a long, long answer to a very simple question, but I guess these are just some of the things which come top of mind to me. No, no, thanks. Thanks, Mr. Manuj. I'm like, that is not here. Like, that is not a lengthy answer because, of course, you actually covered the whole breadth of the topic. And, and yes, I'm like, these points are so apt because this applies to nearly every sector, like whatever sector people are working upon or whatever level, like be their entry level uh, like workforce or their mid mid uh, senior level workforce. So um, this, these uh, specific pointers applies to everyone. So th that's a very, very good information and that's a very good point you have made. So there is again second question and I hope again you have actually included a part of it in your previous answer itself. But this is, this is something really uh, intriguing question for most of the people is like, what role does the technology play in the today's upskilling and reskilling of workforce? And how, so this is more focused towards the businesses, that how businesses can actually leverage the technology to their advantage in upskilling and reskilling of the workforce. Yeah, again, uh, thank you for that question. Very interesting, uh, interesting one. And, uh, you know, as I reflect back, uh, my summary has been that learning can be very boring. And maybe that's the reason why a lot of people don't want to keep reskilling, upskilling. How do we make it a fun game? If we can make it a fun game, then I guess, uh, you know, we're going to see a, a lot of more participation, if you will. How can we make it self-paced? Because two people don't learn at the same pace. And we all know this. We've all been in school and college. We've always admired people who can just pick up stuff, you know, when the when the professor is just delivering the lecture and then some of us have to come pour our books, ask 10 guys, and then figure out what the hell was taught in class today. So I think if it is self-paced, if it is fun, uh, you know, then it's, uh, it's going to be a great value. I think online platforms help significantly today where you can pick and choose content that you like. You can learn at your own pace. I also think that gamification plays an important role because, as I said, the fun element has to be there. So now how do you make sure there are a little bit of rewards, challenges, you know, if, for example, I have completed one module and Amit sends me a box of chocolates saying, Manoj, congratulations. I just saw you did this. You know, it's very, uh -huh. very motivating. Also, I think uh, bite-sized learning. You know, it's very difficult today, and we all know this, uh, the attention span is very, very small. Amit, I'm sure, will have all the data on that. But to my mind, if we can take learning material and break it down into small bites, then these can be very easily assimilated and delivered. And the reason I say this is so when people are in transit, they're in a metro or they're driving down, you know, small modules, they can absorb very quickly. And then if we add the competitive elements like quizzes and a leaderboard, then that adds to the zinc. So I have done this bite-sized module. I do a, answer a couple of questions and it pops up and tells me where I am on the leaderboard. Next time there is a break or there's a lunch break, I want to go and make sure that I improve and I move up the, the leaderboard. So I think that again becomes a, an important piece. I would also say for organizations today, AI and ML uh, can help very significantly in picking up threads on every individual's learning abilities, their preferences, the pace at which they are learning. And once you have this information, then the learning experience can be personalized. Uh, so I think that's another important piece. Last but not least of all, and I'm sure Amit has joined by now, and I want to hand this over to him, is on the, on the collaboration and knowledge sharing. In the past, we had to get into a classroom uh, to be able to learn from our peers and colleagues. But I think tools like this, like the one we're using today, uh, can play a very, very important role where people can get together, share with others what they have learned, uh, and you can do that using multimedia. Uh, and that's fantastic. Uh, and of course, for people who are very career-oriented guys, the good news is uh, you can do digital certification so that you can update your CV as soon as you've acquired a new skill. Uh, and I think for organizations, uh, this is a fantastic tool that can also be used to verify credentials of professionals as you're hiring them, particularly for new skills. Uh, so, right, um, uh, Amit, I hope you're back and, uh, and over to you. Please. Yes, Mr. Manoj. Yes, thanks, Mr. Manoj. Uh, Mr. Amit, sorry, actually, while uh, we, we got you disconnected, so I just moved to the second question, which was related to technology for Mr. Manoj. But uh, I would still want you to address the first question because that'll be a very apt question for you being the CHRO. So I'm like, 
being a CHRO and like you're managing and you're actually interacting with the whole workforce across your company, what do you as an HR, because I mean, you uh, work very closely with and you interact with close, closely with every department leaders, every function, every level of people. So what do you think that which are the most critical skills or competencies that the current modern for, uh, workforce needs to acquire so that uh, the upskilling and reskilling can help them grow very rapidly in their careers? Yeah, sure, Kunal, and I'm really sorry, uh, my friends, because I feel the technology always fail you when you need it most. My router was never uh, no restarted in the last whole year, but it got restarted today in mid of this session. <laughs> sorry. Okay, so I was listening to Manoj, and it was truly interesting. He just did touch upon about the digital literacy, the empathy we need, and others so relevant to that. And I think it was bang on, you know, uh, nobody could have conceptualize this better. And yet, I have few other areas, you know, which I feel and observe, because I keep going to, you know, uh, back to the campuses, college, meeting new fresh blood from the market, the people who are coming back to the jobs from their entrepreneurial journey, and all, all those personas. And what, what I felt is, other than digital literacy, I think Data literacy is also a very crucial aspect of it, right? So understanding data, how to interpret it, and making the decisions based on it is just not for the data scientist, but for everyone. And we all have to understand this. From many, many years, I can tell you, you know, this is one of my best quote I always remember. It is, it is by Dr. You know, w. Edwards Deming. That he says, in God we all trust, rest must bring the data. And he said it, I don't know how many years ago, but it remains valid and true to the market every single second. And that's what I want to tell you, my friends. Whatever coming your way, it's not unidirectional uh, information, right? So there is always a pedigree, there is always an analysis, there is always a value in that data coming to you. So if you are able to interpret it, analyze it and see that where it takes you, what future does it you know, uh, employ to, you would make the best decision on it. And I think one point uh, uh, about it saying that how you are well aware and how literate are you on the data side is a one crucial point. Other few things which, you know, I think Mr. Manoj has covered almost all of it, but there are two more things which I felt, you know, we should put it, uh, uh, you know, I, since I've been lost in between, I don't know if that's covered or not, is it in emotional intelligence, you know, we, we call it as EQ. That is that is a, one of the trade and competencies we've been talking about from last few decades. But I feel when it comes to the practicality of it, people who, who want to understand it, they kind of very superficial about this. So understanding and managing your own emotions, as well as, you know, empathizing with others, can really make a difference. And the difference would be in the teamwork and your customer interactions. That's how I feel is, again, one of the important part. And last, of course, you know, not putting much time on it, is that how competent are you on the cultural side? And I will put it in, you know, your cultural competence. So as a business become more global nowadays, you know, it's a very small world. We call it was in Kutumbakam. G20 was a theme of it. Understanding and respecting the differences in different cultures is more important than ever. You all, and we all have to understand that how we can use it best of our minds. And if you are able to ace it, my friends, I think, you know, these competencies, along with just uh, Mr. Manoj has elaborated, would work wonders. And it's it's a need of time in that mind share, uh, Mr. Rahul. Over to you, okay? Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Amit. So, I'm mean, like... Uh, I, I can find one very common factor between both of you, like while you were actually answering this specific question, is like digital transformation is a very, very, very important thing that we are actually talking about at, on the company level and of course on the workforce level as well. And yes, we can also relate it pretty well because like uh, while we also interact with our customers, because the kind of tool that we actually serve to our companies. So, and that is the reason I think that digital transformation is one of the very important use cases for us, like when most of the companies are coming back to us. So yes, the leadership is understanding that pretty well. It's high time that the whole workforce also understand and leverage the importance of this digital transformation that we are actually going through. 
it's a revolution that actually we are actually going through <clears throat> and everyone has to actually leverage the benefits of those specific things so uh, third question is like i would just want uh, you uh, mr amit to answer mm -hmm. and then what we can do is like we can actually move to the next question because this third question is again very close to the first question itself but being in hr uh, people just wanted to understand from you that let's say for example i am an individual employee and yes uh, i know that okay find which are the skills or competencies that i actually have to focus upon but then sometimes there are a lot of them as we actually just spoke about there are digital things then there are emotional questions then there's leadership and then there are of course the departmental specific trainings of uh, or the specialized training the subject specific trainings that people also have to go through so what specific advice you as an hr will give to those indi individual employees who are looking forward to or like just starting or already going under upskilling or reskilling themselves in today's competitive job market so what would you advise them like how they can actually keep that balance uh right for all and i think it's very relevant i'm glad you asked this so i, I would just like before i move to the depth of this uh, question and answer it i want to touch upon basic that how do they relate to the upskill and reskill right so i've seen many times you know uh, the generation is confused when they are in job market that you know do i need to reskill or do i need to upskill and the basic difference you know just for you know i know you all are aware but i just want to spend few seconds there so let me talk about upskill it's something that you are aggressing forward path in your current way of profession or technology right and the reskill is something that you are taking a transformative path from your current job stream so example is let's say if you are a graphic designer right and you are using let's say one software and you go learning two new three new softwares it is upskill and it gives you extra edge within your domain then as reskilling you say i'm in hr you know, it becomes so monotonous for me i'm not enjoying or maybe whatsoever the challenges are less i really want to transform or transit to a different department with finance technology that could go with the reskill and here kunal comes the question you asked is that you know, the individual employees who are looking to upskill or reskill in today's market what advice i would give so if you remember at the start of uh, you know, the first question and intro i said that when when we introspect and go and find the gap this is the one exercise which which starts this whole exercise of upskilling and reskilling and the one major advice where you no know, we all should start is self assessment our own assessment right so you should all start by taking a good look at your current skills and compare them where you want to be the best reflection is that imagine yourself Five years, ten years down the line, and see this is what you would be doing. And now take a reverse engineering path, analyze and see what are the gaps for you to do that in your future if you currently go into that. So one part, of course, is you, know, you do your self assessment and think about the areas where you are strong, where you could improve, or you can learn something. Right. Second is you know kind of relate to this, but uh, again you have to see in different light is that you no. Know, keep researching about the trends we we cannot imagine what future would come to us but at least as we said you no know, data is the king when you have a data literate you would you would definitely get cues that where we are heading so keep an eye that what skills are in demand in your field right and this can definitely you know uh, give give you insights about how you shape your further career do you really need to upskill or reskill on that part and how do you do that is it important so you you keep reading what's coming to you you know go, keep researching and that's that's something very very important just do not sit and look that somebody will or something will come to your plate by default and you will absorb that information will act up so you have to constantly work you have to constantly work on that information to dig it to further and last you know uh, before i give it to you uh, and mr manoj is that once you are done with your self assessment and you are constantly researching now the last exercise for this would be the uh, last piece of advice would be that you have to set now clear goals for yourself absolutely very very clear that what you want to be right and this is a resultant of the first two exercise you know we have just done so set some very clear achievable goals and this this might include certifications you know mastering a new skill software tools or getting you proficient in any of other language human skills and that that i feel 
in my my limited capacity, I would say are the top three advices I can give to individuals. So over to you, uh, Rahul. Thanks, 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 Mr. Uh, Amit. So that's that's really very helpful, and like I hope that will help uh, most of the people out there. Now the next question that I have is a very interesting question, and I would both I would want both of you to answer on this. So I'm mean, like. And this is an interesting question, the hot topic in the last few weeks, I should say. So people have asked, what are, uh, what's your take on Narayan Murthy's proposal for a 70-hour work week? Although uh, I don't think, uh, I don't know how people have actually perceived it as like that Mr. Narayan Murthy is saying that as people should have 70 hours work week. What he exactly said was exactly that we are actually still growing and we still have to match up with the, the rest of the world. So I want that the younger generation should come back and should work 70 hours. And they should say that I am ready to work 70 hours. So I just want uh, Mr. Amit and Manoj from you that people talk about work-life balance and productivity in today's professional environment. Now, I have seen people that when we say them that like you upskill yourself or that you reskill yourself, people start doing that during office time. They leave their work and they start uh, focusing on the upskilling and reskilling. And I hope here 70 hour work week comes into the picture where like, Mr. Narayan Murthy must be expecting, at least what I have perceived is, you work 40 hours diligently in your office, in your work week, and rest of the 30 hours put up your, on yourself. Reskill yourself, upskill yourself, go and build something more, but work 70 hours a week. So what are, what are your uh, takes? So I would uh, like to start with you, Mr. Manoj, and then Mr. Amit, you can take over. Sure. Yeah, thank you very much, Rahul, again. Um, so I'm an old world guy. Right, so my responses may be a bit uh, controversial. First of all, we have to look at the kind of work that the individual is doing. Is it more physical or is it more cognitive? Now, if it is physical work, then we know the law of physics come into play. There are only a certain number of hours that a human being can work at a stretch and deliver a productive outcome. And uh, time and motion studies have, have shared all of the data, so I'm not going to repeat what is already in public domain. So if your outcomes are being driven by physical work, then there's a separate set of criteria that needs to apply because at the end of the day, it also depends on the health of the individual and also depends on the age. So if you were to ask me how many hours can I physically put in in work which is predominantly physical, I can assure you it's significantly lesser than what Amit or you could put in. When it comes to cognitive, then the world kind of shifts a little bit. And many times uh, we may or may not realize that many of us subconsciously are at work almost all the time. And what do I mean by that? As I said, one of the important skills to succeed in the past, now and in the future is the ability to solve problems. And Amit alluded to using data to help solving problems. And Amit, uh, I was chuckling to myself when you were talking about data because I spent 10 years of my career just convincing people on the importance of data infrastructure. So I, I built a, a lot of my career just around that. And I'm very happy to see that all of you today are talking about data. So some of us must have done something right in the past to get everyone to see the value of data. And I come back to that, right? So you want to solve a problem. Many times you will hear colleagues, Rahul, tell you that I was in the shower and all of a sudden I figured out how I could crack it. Or when I was shaving in the morning, I figured it out. Or when I was sitting on my throne in the morning, you know, I figured it out. The reason is because subconsciously we are working all the time. So if you look at roles which are largely cognitive, and I think if everyone just kind of starts clocking, the amount of time we are actually physically at a workplace or working on projects or thinking about them or sleeping with them and waking up in the morning, right, still trying to grapple with them, in a way we are applying ourselves to solving those problems. And therefore the way I look at 70 hours or 90 hours or 100 hours is, from a perspective of how engaged are you in terms of delivering the outcomes that are expected of you. Now, some of us are smarter than others. So we can do it in a shorter period of time. Some people like me just take longer. I mean, I just take longer to learn. 
and understand and solve problems. Uh, may not be true, Rahul, of you. So therefore, I don't want to put a stricture around number of hours. I think for a person like me, 70 is also less. For somebody else, 40 could be good enough. So I think we need to look at ourselves, and Amit alluded to that, said you must do a self-assessment that how good am I in terms of problem solving? How good am I in terms of delivering outcomes? Uh, you know, maybe my cognitive skills are top class. Maybe my IQ levels are top class. Then I can deliver that in fewer hours. An average person, you know, will tend to take much longer. I know this is not a good enough answer. In terms of work-life balance, I think if you want to build a long-term career, and again, I'm old-fashioned, pardon me for my candidness. As far as I am concerned, if you want to build a long-term successful career, you will have to give up one of the two. Either you'll have to give up your career or you'll have to give up, uh, you know, spending time with, uh, with, as they say, right, to, to drive balance side. I think it's incredibly hard. Ultimately, it just does boil down to a choice. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Manoj. I mean, like, that is really a very insightful answer. And yes, as it is said, if you actually want to taste, uh, uh, like, make a tasty dish, it will definitely need more time. And as you said, like, these smart workers might be doing the work in lesser hours, but then they might have invested a lot of hours in the previous days of their life to actually learn those smartness, that smartness or that. that smartness. Not, not only, I mean, some guys just are quick learners. Yeah. And you would have seen that in college. There are guys who in class, at the end of class, would be able to tell you exactly what the professor was trying to trying to say. And there are many people like me who couldn't even get beyond the first three minutes of what the professor was talking about. So we have to accept the fact that the world is not equal. There are people, bunch of guys, many guys, who are smarter than the others. So guys like me who are less smart have to put in more effort, time and energy and cannot talk of work-life balance. Somebody smarter can certainly do it. Of course, of course. Yes, yes. That, I mean, that's a very great perspective. So Mr. Amit, um, uh, if, so as uh, Mr. Manu said, he, he comes with a wealth of experience and a very senior guy. You coming and you actually interacting with the modern workforce. What do you think, uh, like the people's perspective? You might have heard many people talking about this also at work. So what do you think and what's your own perspective on this specific point? Uh, right, Kunal. And I would say, Manoj, being very humble and you know, repeatedly coming to that, taking more time, I think. But I found him to be the most, uh, you know, uh, that with the most wisdom and experience with the knowledge. And I, and I, I'm sure, Manoj, you won't take, uh, go beyond three, but you would, you are the guy who at the end of the lecture would summarize in two minutes. Okay. But cool. Uh, comment to that. I feel the, the comment uh, made by Mr. Murthy about the uh, 70 hours is, is, it's kind of, you no. Know, is a double uh, you know, uh, edge sword. For few, it may resonate well. For few, it may not. And I'll tell you why. And as Mr. Manoj mentioned, you know, I think for me also, the best of thoughts come to, you know, when I'm doing the mundane tasks, like in shower, okay? Why so? Because as you excel in your career and more responsibilities keep adding to your thought, the job becomes 24 into 7 of it. Not that no, you have to be physically there, but as far as your mind goes, you keep thinking about solving that particular problem, issue, or challenge, or whatever. So, in a turn, whatever you are doing at your role, which is challenging and you know, gives you opportunity, you are in a constant thought process of solving that or kind of taking it to the next level. And I think most of the people who are listening will resonate. But here it comes the second challenge when you are, in, as Mr. Manu said, that. If it requires more physical work, right, for you to be present or maybe in, in the manufacturing setup. What I've seen personally, many of the time it becomes overwhelming. And what I mean by overwhelming, that you tend to do best of your you know, uh, work within the time and you know, when work requires more hours, you lose that balance in your life, your work-life balance, right? The time you want to spend with family. And, of course, your thought process also. Hence, it's very critical to mention here is that every human, every human has a capacity, right? Capacity to work on a number of us, capacity to think. And body, of course, needs a recharge. Why do we sleep? Why do we, you know, take rest? Why our neurons don't run at the same velocity at the time? So, we are built that way, right? 
So one going against the whole concept of not taking a proper rest. And here, here the mention is that every individual will have a different, different ask, different demand from taking the rest. Not spending much time, but telling you one thing. Instead of enforcing and telling that how many hours you work, I would go with the opinion, you know, work as many hours as you can in the job or work or business you are loving to do without getting fatigued. And that's a mantra I follow. I don't want to work at the cost of my life or my health, but I also do not want to just stop myself on my productive hours where I could contribute more and then stop myself say, oh, no, this is that. So it's, it's, a, it's a very nice balance. You need to figure out individual to individual that where you should stop, where the line is being drawn, and then you take it from there. And the last thought before, you know, I give it to you back in our days. Once you go to that journey, and once you progress in your career, just do not limit yourself that I have a cutoff at 7 hour or 8 hour or 9 hour. That something will push you at the bottom of the curve. My suggestion would be always look retrospectively and then future looking that this is what I would be doing. Am I able to do that in these limited hours? If not, how much more should I contribute without getting yourself fatigued and mentally exhausted? Over to you, Kunal. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Amit. So, uh, Amna, I, yeah, that's that's pretty helpful because two different perspectives coming from two different depth of experiences and two very different kind of uh, backgrounds that you both are coming from. So that that's really helpful. And in fact, like I am also able to get a very different kind of perspective on this specific point. Uh, the fifth question, uh, the last question that I have for both of you is a pretty interesting one. And <clears throat> I'm pretty sure this might be coming from the mid senior level guys. So we keep hearing this specific point from many of the people that you are learning a lot of things to, to grow yourself, but at the same point of time, you also have to unlearn something, some specific things for a faster growth. So this is something that most of the people don't understand that. What, what do we mean by unlearning and what are those unlearning areas? I'm, what are the things that I should unlearn so, and how that can contribute to my personal growth and development. So, uh, over this, like uh, Mr. Manoj, I would want to start with you and your thoughts, and then Mr. Amit, you can actually give your closing remarks on this specific question. So. Sure. Right. Uh, yeah. Again, Kunal, thank you very much, uh, much for uh, asking this very thought-provoking question. You know, unlearning is all about letting go of what you know, uh, and, and uh, the reason why you have to let go of what you know is because many of it. Uh, and as Amit has mentioned, right, is getting outdated uh, because of the rate and pace of change. And therefore, you know, it's like turning around and saying, if I have a store full of junk, before I add more junk, I need to clear it out. Because when you clear it out, then, uh, you know, things should be, should be much, much better. So I would say that, uh, you know, please do make sure that, uh, you know, you make room for new perspectives and ideas. Uh, and that is super important. I would also say that uh, many of us recognize that it's difficult to have a beginner's mindset. And Kunal, you mentioned, right, it's from maybe mid to senior level executives. Uh, many of them find it hard to have a beginner's mindset because they say, look, we've been through that. We worked for 10, 15, 20, 30 years. And how can, how can we now go back to the beginning? But having a beginner's mindset is about the ability to generate new ideas and find newer solutions based on the newer technologies, offerings, and body of knowledge. Uh, so unlearning also helps one become a better collaborator because as you unlearn, you learn new things, then you're able to communicate uh, with the team and they will also see you as being relevant to the cause. Last but not le least of all, I think self-awareness is important and individuals need to make these choices particularly around personal development, recognizing the way that unless they reinvent themselves and unless they break away from their past, it's going to be very difficult for them to continue to have the roles that they have and to continue to succeed and build a strong future. So I would say unlearning and learning both go hand in hand and they have to, and they have to be there on a continuous basis 
for every individual and every individual needs to decide what is the path that they want to follow going forward in the future otherwise uh, you know as i've said earlier i'd like to end by saying that your career is going to uh, be short lived uh, be thankful if you last 10 years uh, unless you very quickly unlearn and relearn uh, back to you kunal thank you yeah to you mr amit yeah thank you mr amit and i think mr manoj covers almost everything i want to speak <laughs> but great because that that's what it tells that you know you're thinking are aligned you are thinking on the same and it's it's a right path but let let me add just two three points i don't have much so i i want to start with this that you know a learning is a fascinating concept for your personal growth and development right it's all about you know the challenging and you letting go your old beliefs your habits the assumptions you have made over the time which are no longer serving you you are just holding on to them for no reason and that's what i think from the first point is that you know it's it's all about breaking free from your beliefs from from the stereotypes you have made for yourself and i give you one example right so let let's say in in your own mind many of us believe that i'm not good at speaking in public and i guarantee you at majority of times or no plenty of us haven't even tried that so if if you have not even tried and you know we have not experimented with that how this belief has encountered you like how you how you have made yourself believing that you are not a good speaker example is other example i cannot change my career at this age like say let's say i have spent two decades in hr now i see that i don't want or i cannot do anything it's wrong now i could be next no uh, let's say a uh, uh, cfo or ceo or whatever or i could be a successful businessman it's all about that you no know, these beliefs we have made for ourselves and we kind of confined ourselves in those thinking that this is what i am i cannot do anything else so unlearn unlearning these had to go unlearning these will open up new possibilities and that is the one point second of course which ms manoj has also no touched upon and there is there's a one pivotal point here i want to mention is is that adapting to change is very very important the world is changing rapidly and being stuck in this old ways of thinking would hold us back here unlearning helps us to adapt by embracing new ways of thinking and doing right we have to come out of this shell we have to see and we have to embrace the change and last point you know as the time is up in an essence and we are only just one minute left with that last point i want to mention is that we have to have you know uh, i think work on enhancing our relationships what i mean by that that unlearning stereotypical thinking can improve our relationship with others right fostering greater empathy and understanding and this is i think is a major roadblock we kind of hesitated many of the times to approach for help to seek advice you know to take a coaching so this is you know and to build that what rewarding relationship with your you know peers is is a major roadblock so these three things i think are very important when we talk about unlearning is that you have to break, break free from your beliefs the limited beliefs second is that you adapting to change and third i i think is you know you have to work enhancing your relationships at work over to you ra thanks thanks mr amit and like i'm really delighted with the with the kind of knowledge and the kind of uh, thoughts and uh, the experiences that you both have shared today in this wonderful wonderful discussion and and the amazing part is like you both shared so intense and so deep thoughts and still we were able to finish it up in one hour i'm like i don't uh, i was not able to understand when this one hour passed by and i'm pretty sure that the people were actually able to get very very important insights today so thanks again both of you for your time and valuable insights around this uh, very important topic and thanks for addressing the questions from our listeners which were who were very excited to like get the answers to their question i'm pretty sure that everyone who was a part of this conversation was able to get some really useful insights so all the best with the great work that you both are doing to empower the workforce at your respective organizations and it was really lovely and nice to have both of you here thank you all thank you all thank you thank you very much thanks thanks again sir so cheers and keep rocking and uh, thanks to all of our listeners hope you all have got real amazing insights today 
Cheers and keep rocking. See you all in our next episode.